Well, good morning. My name's Ian Wilson. I'm, I'm Chief Executive of the Property Franchise Group. I'm joined by my colleague, David Raggett, who will introduce himself properly in, 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 in just a moment as he sort of leads off on financials. But a uh, cu- couple of points um, I'd quite like to make. The first is that I've been 16 years with a business. Um, I've also been six years as the chief executive. So I've been chief exec since uh, since we listed on, on AIM at the end of 2013. I'm told six years is the average length of time for a, a chief executive to stay in post compared to football managers where the average is 18 months. So um, I've been an average length of time, and as you might have read, I've announced that I'm, I'm intending to retire at the uh, at, at, at no later than the end of 2020. Uh, the long goodbye, as one of our investors said, and the advantages of that is we've got plenty of time to make the right decision about the the next CEO who follows on from me, and um, and there'll be time to do a proper handover as well. So there's no surprises and no rush. We we just want to signal that that that, that that's our intention. The other thing I'd like to say is that I am a stockholder myself. I've got just under one and a half million shares in the company. So um, I'm as keen as anybody to see the dividend uh, progress over the next few years and and not do anything that would undermine the share price. So it does mean that my interests as as a, if you like, a professional manager of the business are also aligned with those of investors. We've always run a franchise model. So from the day I first arrived as the first professional MD, what we did is we sold franchises and we sold them to people that were typically not um, properly professionals. They might have been policemen, servicemen, IT consultants, bank managers. We've had all of those. We've also had vicars and tennis coaches, which are probably the most exotic um, franchise recruits that we've had. Um, though one of them, in fact, was the ex-professional belly dancing champion of the UK before I arrived, which uh, is even more exotic. Um, and what we did is we taught them how to let houses and, and manage properties. Um, we got them bank funding, we put them onto the high street, and we had a very simple business model, which was they had to manage 50 properties at the end of year one, 100 properties by the end of year two. So we, over the course of um, that, that sort of first decade that, that I was with the business, we sold a lot of franchises and we built up a sustainable network of, of, of letting um, businesses. Um, so by the time we got to 2015, we were managing about 30,000 units, um, residential units. Uh, we had 180 odd uh, franchisees trading and we came to AIM with, with two purposes. One was a partial uh, sell down by the founder so he retained a 50% stake, but he, he wanted to sort of uh, de-risk and, and partial sell down because of, because of his age. Um, and secondly, David and I raised four million pounds of, of new money, and we went out and began to buy other people's property franchises. So we bought from Legal and General four brands: Parkers, CJ Hull, Ellison Co, and White Gates, and added another 90 offices to our network. And then we, we found another business called UMove, which was a hybrid online business um, operating a franchise model, had sold a lot of franchises, was, was, was very highly regarded um, by its franchisees, um, highly regarded on Trustpilot. It was the most trusted estate agent, letting agent in the UK. And we bought that and we added it to our portfolio because we thought we had a growth story there as well. So we come to where we are now with six brands covering everything from brands that are more sales focused, like CJ Hole and Bristol, been trading for 150 years, to brands that are very lettings focused, like Martin & Co. And we also cover off the new style online hybrid uh, brand, UMove, um, which uh, operates without the the need for high street premises. So, So that's our position. We are a conservative business. So if you fancy something racy, we're probably not for you. Um, and we, we, our, our proposition to our investors was that we would, they would see capital growth because um, we would be acquisitive and we wanted to grow organically as well. So they would see capital growth in the stock price and we've delivered on that. We also promised a progressive dividend policy and I'm pleased to say that we've moved the divvy up every single year that we've been on AIM. And our dividend last year was 8.4p. And we've announced in this set of results a further increase in dividend for this year. So despite all of um, the perceived doom and gloom around the UK uh, property market, we we have maintained that progressive dividend policy. And it's our aim as a business to uh, be be paying out a 10p divvy in in the foreseeable future. So um, we are both a capital growth stock and we've also been uh, an uh, an income stock. 
If we turn to today's presentation then, and I'll just do a, a, a very simple overview. Um, this is a year where there are really two uh, poison chalices that have been handed to businesses like us. One is government intervention, um, which was that um, the British government decided it would ban us from charging tenant fees. And that ban came in on the 1st of June. And it means that uh, to all intents and purposes, we can no longer charge uh, fees to tenants. We've got to get all of our revenue by charging, charging landlords. Um, the situation in Scotland is that the, the, the government banned fees in Scotland in 2012. We trade in Scotland and therefore we've got a lot of historic uh, uh, evidence and understanding of how this, the fee ban affected the Scottish market. And therefore, we're not flying blind in the uh, steps that we've taken here in, in, in England to mitigate the effects of the ban. And we'll come on to that a little bit later in the presentation. The second poison chalice is, of course, that we've got um, a lot of political turbulence, a lot of dark clouds, prospect of a, a, an early general election. These things are not good for the housing market. People suspend buying and selling properties. They put off for another day until they're more certain of outcomes. And that means that to all intents and purposes, we've probably got one of the most difficult sales markets that we've had in, in the last decade. Um, sales transaction volumes have been quite flat for the last couple of years. This year, 2019, might be a new record low. Um, and of course, as you'll be um, uh, sophisticated investors, you'll know that estate agents don't make their money about ha but when house prices are rising or falling. They make their money on the volume of stock that's being traded, and, and therefore it's going to be a tricky year. So despite all of that, um, what we call our management services fees, which is our royalty income from our franchise businesses, they're up. Um, we've improved profits and we're putting our dividend up as well. And rather, I think, spectacularly, all six of our brands, despite the fact that they've got these uh, differences in, in their composition, we managed to improve network revenue year on year across all, all six of our brands. We've increased our royalties, and in particular, we've moved our royalties up from lettings quite significantly by 6% in our traditional brand business. Our you move business continued to make progress this year, and we moved our MSF up by 15%. So um, interim dividend has gone up because um, we're generating cash. The balance sheet position is very strong. We've got a progressive dividend policy. So we're, we're keeping our, our promise to our investors and we're honoring pro progressive divi. In what ways are we supporting our franchisees? Um, well, we're helping them buy out their local competitors because as other agents are struggling and are giving up and are selling down and retiring early, their managed book, their, their portfolio of properties that they manage on behalf of private clients is, uh, is becoming available for sale. And we help our franchisees in a number of ways to, to acquire those books of business. We also invested a couple of years ago in an absolutely top-notch marketing director who came from Virgin Media. And the things that we learned from our online operation, you move, we are now transplanting into our traditional brand business. Therefore, we're running centralized pay-per-click campaigns uh, we've optimized our websites so that they're, they're good at converting visitors into, into leads. And um, we are continuing to learn and improve our performance in, in that digital domain. Um, we believe that we are particularly well positioned to take advantage of these challenging conditions. Um, you know, there will be asset sales in the future. Other people will give up the ghost. There'll be disposals. We also find, of course, because our franchisees are um, individual uh, owner managers, they're entrepreneurial, um, they've got the kids' school fees to pay, and therefore, when we give them a lead and we give them advice about how they should adapt to the market, we find the majority of them are very receptive to that, and they've proved to be highly resi resilient. Uh, and where we've offered help in, in, in the form of digital marketing or help with acquisitions, they, they've taken those offers of help. Um, David's a very conservative CFO. Um, I like conservative CFOs. They run, they run strong balance sheets, and, and we have a very strong balance sheet. We've significantly improved it over the last 12, 12 months trading, um, and, and David will talk about that in, in a little bit further. One of the areas where we perceive that we've been weaker than perhaps some of our peers is that we've not really benefited from a, a strong financial services strategy. Um, we've been funneling leads into uh, a big call center uh, operated by uh, 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 London and Country as the brand. I'm sure you've heard of them. 
Um, they're very proud of the fact there are no fee operation. They're based in Bath. They've got hundreds of people working out of the call center. But our franchisees have not particularly taken uh, to that. They've not been funneling a lot of leads through. The conversion of the leads hasn't been so strong. And so David and I are contemplating a different financial services strategy, which we will announce probably uh, at the start of next year. And, um, and that means that there's an upside, essentially, which is that we do less than 2% of our uh, revenue generation from financial services at the moment. And if we had a better strategy, we could significantly improve that and improve our profitability. So what you see at the moment is really a, um, a lettings dominated business um, with some sales, about 70% lettings, 30% sales, um, very small financial services uh, gen generation at the moment, either for revenue or for profit, and therefore some potential upsides if we can get our strategy right. Um, but given our strong cash generation and, and strong balance sheet, well positioned to take advantage of opportunities as they arise. And with that, I'm going to hand over to David. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a bit of background on myself quickly. Um, I'm one of those very technically trained accountants. That's what I did for a degree. And then I came out into commerce to learn about the other side and on which things I should pay a bit more attention to. Um, about ooh, six and a bit years ago now, um, I met Ian for the first time. Uh, they were contemplating what they did with the business and, and had made this sort of decision to uh, recruit themselves an FD. And um, what they pro provided to me amongst many things, I remember to this day, was a business that every year had grown year on year, both, both revenue and, and uh, profitability. Um, and uh, Richard, uh, the founder, and, and Ian, knowing everything they seemed to know about the sector. Um, I mean, I've always worked in franchising, so I, I know plenty about that, but uh, they knew absolutely everything there was. And I've, over the course of about mm, six weeks and probably four or five meetings between us, um, I th we came to a decision, and I think it was, hopefully it was mutual, um, that um, it was a, a relationship worth furthering, and, um, and I joined the business, and the first thing they really wanted to do was look at some of their activities and decide whether they were um, sufficiently profit-making or not. Um, and I am one of those who has spent a lifetime looking at these things and doing business turnarounds, amongst other things. And, and I looked at the business and we um, divested of a few things at that point in time. And actually the strategy they were pursuing, we, we, went to the, we decided we'd go in a different direction. Um, and once we'd done that, we decided the next stage would be an IPO. Um, we needed to come to the market, have available some funds to go on and, and buy some businesses that we'd already started to identify that we thought would have a pretty decent return. Um, and so um, came in, um, we got on, we got ourselves to IPO, we'd identified a target which was uh, owned by Legal and General. Um, we bought that business, it took us t probably the best part of eight months before we, we got the deal across the line. But we bought that business in October, well, two businesses in October 2014 um, for £5 million. Um, and within two years, it was making a million pounds of after tax earnings. So um, we were pretty happy about that. Um, and uh, whilst doing that, it, it also opened up sales for us for the first time. So we looked at sales and we said, OK, within these brands are some very, very experienced sales um, or say agents. And we ought to um, bring their experience across into the other brands uh, whilst they were benefiting from the lettings knowledge that we'd par um, parted on to them. And, and, and what we've done over time is we've grew, grown a group of franchisees who don't change very often. I mean, they're tremendously uh, loyal, um, but we've grown and grown and grown their, their returns. And off the back of that, of course, we've grown our own royalties and, and we've grown our, our PBT every year. Year. So it, it's been a, a, a successful continuing pattern and the one thing I learned early on about franchisees, because I was one, is that every day they get up and they think, what do we got to do today? Yeah, what are we going to do today? They are focused right at the coalface about what needs to happen and they get on and make those decisions. And that is an attitude that sort of pervades across franchise networks, not only ours, but good franchise networks. That's how the franchisees work. And, and, and we've got a very long-term committed set of franchisees. Um, so um, it is a little surprise to me, although it is to some people, I guess, but it's a little surprise to me that um, even in tough times, we will see them driving on their network revenue. And as a result of it, because they have, we, we have seen our MSF again increase this year from uh, half a year from 4.4 to 4.6 million. And um, 
we knew at the start of this year that it was going to be tougher. So, um, you know, we, we look at where we want to spend our money and we just make a decision that consciously we'll hold back in certain areas to see how the, how the year goes. And as a result of that, because of just holding back on those purse strings, um, we've seen that 5% increase in royalties um, flow through to our bottom line. In fact, profits up 6% year on year. Um, off the back of that, we've also seen our, our, our free cash flow um, so that's what we generate from operations go from 2 million to 2.2 million, so up about 11%. So we are really just focused on generating cash from those activities we see are most beneficial at this point in time. And whilst the sales market is struggling and we're, we're helping our franchisees with, the, with digital marketing, um, we are still reinforcing to them that they need to keep pressing on with um, lettings. The more income you can generate from management services that's recurring, the, the greater the value of your business, let alone the year-to-year the, uh, -year revenues that you'll generate. And so we, we keep going on and on with that message. And having our mix, that's letting sales and, and financial services um, <coughs> swing a little bit in terms towards sales because we've got you move and it's principally focused on sales, we've steadily been just driving that back a little bit. So now lettings constitutes about 70% of our MSF. And we're just gradually, I mean, we're just gradually keep moving that down a little bit. Um, that's important for long-term growth and stability of the network. Um, uh, Connect Cash, yes, we are um, 2.8 million at this point in time. Um, in fact, 3.9 million of cash just over sits on our balance sheet at the end of June. Um, it wasn't a difficult decision for us, given our progressive dividend policy and, and profit before tax up 6% to uh, increase the internet dividend by 8%. Um, there is a you know, the, the, there's a need for us to maintain a strong balance sheet at this point in time because we do feel there are some opportunities that will come to market in the next 12 months. And uh, we don't want to over dilute investors. In fact, with dilutions, one of the things we're not very keen on. Um, debt's quite cheap at this moment with a strong balance sheet. We, we can borrow quite a bit if we need to um, short term. Um, and to have some cash there on hand just keeps it um, keeps it tight for us. It means we'll, we'll retain a tight balance sheet going forward uh, without too much dilution. Financial performance. Um, so last year we achieved 11.3 million of, t of uh, revenue. This year, uh, I think we'll do well to get to that revenue level. Um, there's some headwinds yet, I think, in, in, in 2019 because of the political uncertainties, um, but we'll be there or, th or thereabouts. Um, I'll skip over EBITDA to, to profit before tax, which was 4.3 million last year. Curiously, every year, the second half of the year is better than the first half. It's not just for us, that's for um, all agents. Um, but um, this year, um, second half of the year started quite well for everybody, including ourselves. Um, there's been a lot of pent up tenant uh, demand that's been serviced in the last two months in the market. Um, so we've seen numbers quite out of step with prior years. I should, I'm sure it's not just us, it's everybody seeing that. So whilst there's a relatively slow sales market, lettings market has, has probably been, um, the, the demand's been there or building up because tenants didn't want to move until the tenant fee ban had come in. They wanted to see the impact of that and they wanted to decide then where they would move to. Um, and so that's been building over the months up to June and now we're all seeing that start to come into the market. And that's helping a lot right now. On the slide six that is in the presentation, um, this gives you no more than a, a breakdown of, of where our revenue comes from. Um, so at the right now in this half year, 85% of it coming from royalties. It's been, that, that percentage has been creeping up gradually all the time. Um, we still engage in franchise sales to, to new entrants, um, especially in, in, in New Move. We engage in resales of franchises when franchisees wish to sell, although not too many wish to sell this year at all. I think it's the lowest level we've, I've ever seen on the board. I think there's five businesses up there at the moment. Um, it's, it's quite quite incredible. They, they all see the, the strength of the position that they're in and want to progress at this point. Um, and we, we um, provide frontline support for our operating systems. So um, our franchisees run on one or two operating systems uh, in the cloud, but we provide all the frontline support for them down in Bournemouth. And as a result of that, we charge them for that. And most of our other income is made up of those charges. On slide seven, there's some track record as to our management service fees, both from, from lettings and from sales. And I've put on there July uh, 19, just so you can see how things have, have started to progress once we, we, we've turned the, into the second half year. Um, I, I'm not sure as I read too much into the um, sales MSF, apart from the fact that 
um, July and, uh, is, is usually quite a good month for closing before people go on holiday. And then we'll start to see um, business again tick up in September, October, uh, before it, it runs out to a, fa a fairly decent level in December. But it was lettings that's interested me the most, um, that, that, that drive in um, from June to July. Uh, and indeed, most of that uh, is, is getting retained at this moment in time. Now, whether that's just a hiatus and it drops back, I don't know. But um, I, I, I think there's a strong chance that we will at least follow a similar pattern out through the rest of the of the year. So where that green line is, which will be 2018, we'll be running above that, uh, which is really encouraging considering there's been a tenant fee ban, which... Uh, at, a, at a gross level will have impacted franchisees' revenues by 16% before they've done any mitigation. So um, that's very encouraging. Now, as they start to mitigate the tenant fee ban, and um, we've got some strategies for that, and Ian will come on to, um, we will start to see some upside from that activity as well. You move operates in a slightly different way to the traditional brands. Traditional brands charge a relative 9% of, of revenue. Uh, to the franchisees. You moved us two things. It charges a license fee per month, which is a thousand pound at the moment, and that's for advertising on Rightmove, Zoopla, uh, for access to systems and various digital marketing um, applications that the, the franchisees make use of. And then it charges a flat fee of £250 for a completion on a sale or a let. Um, there are some lettings that are slightly less, but generally across the board it's £250. Um, the long-term goal of us clearly is to get our licenses, license fees to a level where they cover all the administrative costs of the business and then every completion it goes through is, is profit for us and that's where we've been trying to drive things to. So l license fees are, aren't moving you know, they're fairly static th this year so far and that's because the franchise network's been fairly static so far this year. Um, transactions completed um, sales up 16%, so this is slide eight. Sales are up 16% year on year in new move um, and lettings are up 12%. Now, um, that's an average, so you, know, you start to look at the numbers and sometimes you say, really, is, is that difference between one line and the other that amount but but it is and that's so so that's good what's happened in you move is that they have got very good at converting what have been falling number of instructions this year into um uh in or opportunities into instructions and into sales so they are very very good at that they've, they've improved considerably and when we start measuring ourselves against the best and purple bricks has put various statements out there to try and demonstrate why it's the best. Um, you, you move certainly lives up to those standards. And compared to a, an average agent in the in the high street, it's achieving about 20 to 25 percent more than they do, which is quite quite considerable. And, and and you know one of its strengths must be the fact that it's been on Trustpilot now between number one agent for sales and lettings on Trustpilot since 2016, I think. Um, so it's got a very strong following and because it was built by two people, one of whom was completely um, committed to customer service uh, and as part of it you put in place a net promoter score and that increases year on year within the network. So they are completely fixated about customer service uh, and, well, and well, do to that, well done to them because in a tough market you know, they've, they've really lived off the back of it. Um, I think that's me done Ian. Thank you David. So, given that we, it, what's important to us, most important is is um, is our lettings business because if you manage properties, then of course you collect the rents every month, you charge commission to the landlords, um, and therefore you've got that recurring income stream. Um, we we continue to encourage our franchisees to um, bring on more managed business, uh, so organic growth, either finding more landlords or getting existing landlords to bring them more business that um, uh, properties that they, they, they own and, and, and have elsewhere. Um, and also we help them with assisted acquisitions. So local competitors selling up, um, we, we pick up that, those portfolios. And they, they can range vastly from 500 managed properties down to just 25 properties. But 25 properties added to an existing business is um, very lucrative because you probably don't need to increase your overhead, you don't need an, another right move subscription, you don't need any more staff. But those 25 properties, particularly here in the south of England, are probably going to be a thousand pound rent, 
10% management commission. It's a nice income stream to, to bolt onto something that you've already got. Um, we also, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, have been uh, organizing ourselves centrally to get better at pay-per-click. And with the White Gates brand in the north, which has got um, good provenance, uh, the brand's been trading since the 1970s, we're now on to, in some locations, second or even third generation of local customers. So their parents might have bought a house through White Gates. They themselves are now first-time buyers looking to buy. Because we've got that good, strong local provenance, when you add a digital campaign, you, um, you're, if you like, trading on the back of that goodwill toward the brand. And what we've noticed is that the cost of a click is significantly reduced. So you find that where you've got good physical presence and provenance in an area, and then you add the digital marketing domain, what you get is tremendous value for money. <coughs> and we've got cost per click down at three or four pounds per click in, in, in some locations. It's also an industry which is quite backward um, when it comes to uh, digital marketing. Therefore, in, in many geographies, we are perhaps only one of two or three businesses that are running PPC. And if you compare and contrast that to other industries where every player will be running PPC and therefore driving up cost, because effectively you're, you're bidding against other, other competitors, then again, we can derive tremendous value from, from PPC. You move, we, we've talked about, um, you might find us a bit sensitive because I think we, we probably got a little bit of flack when we bought you move from some of our investors. Um, it wasn't a lettings predicated business. Um, it was part of the kind of the new wave of online operators. And I think some investors probably sort of said, well, you know, wish you just bided your time a bit more and to see how the market matured. Um, do we regret the decision? No, we don't. Um, our, our custodial uh, 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 stewardship of that, that business has meant that um, certainly this year we'll be generating good profit from it. Um, we still see it as a growth vehicle. And uh, we, at the end of the day, paid £9 million for it, and I could justify it's £9 million of value. We also have um, stripped out a lot of that know-how and expertise and, and, and on, on the digital front. It gave us the confidence to, um, to build a digital strategy for our traditional brand business. The other thing to work, but worth bearing in mind is at slide 12, you know, franchisees might have been new when they started, but they have matured now into, into being solid, reliable uh, business people run, running good operations. Not not 100%. We, you know, we still find people in our network that we, we have a falling out with because they aren't maintaining our standards. Um, we are robust. I mean, in my 16 years, I've, I've been into the high court three times, obtained injunctions to, to close people down and stop them trading. Um, I was successful on every occasion I've been into the high court. So you find us that, that, that we're, um, we're their best friend, but we're their worst enemy if they're not maintaining brand standards. And, and therefore, we, we do have a policeman role when it comes to, to our franchisees. It's interesting that the government's persuaded that it needs to regulate our industry. Um, so it's brought forward measures to, uh, to bring in a, a unitary regulator for um, letting agents and estate agents. Um, we are that unitary regulator when it comes to our brands. We maintain standards. Um, a little bit more colour around the tenor fee ban. There's a shortage of rental accommodation, particularly here in the capital. It's probably been all too easy to charge tenants very, very high setting up fees when they've entered into a tenancy. Um, I've seen fees as high as £800 per month you know, for, for, for an initial uh, letting. Um, in Bristol, um, it's, it's, it's well known that some landlords have never paid a bean to let their property because the agents could charge such uh, extravagant fees to the tenants that they didn't need to charge the landlords. And so they'd say, bring us your properties in the, in the Bristol Basin. We'll let them and we won't charge you anything for the letting. Well, the government's overturned all of that uh, as a result of um, really a cross-party political belief that, that agents were overcharging tenants and, and, and price gouging. We, we can't charge. What's the implication for that? Well, it's quite serious. Across our network, our franchisees are looking at about 10 million pounds of lost revenue. And when you think that there's no corresponding cost savings, then you could say that's 10 million pounds of profit gone down the drain as well. 
So we've taken the matter very seriously. We've been training our franchisees for two years on techniques to mitigate tenant fees. Um, but like everything, um, they've only really snapped fully into focus from the start of this year when, when they knew that the law was going to be, uh, going to be affected. To give you an idea of what the typical mitigation looks like, if we can add 1.25% to the fee that we're charging landlords um, and at the same time increase the average rent um, by £50 per month, we can fully mitigate the effect of the ban. Now, how hard is that? Well, if you're in Islington, you can probably add 50 quid to the rent fairly easily. If you're in Bolton, £50 on the rent's a bit harder. It might take you a couple of years to get those kind of rent increases. But across the whole of our estate, um, we reckon that by the end of 2020, we will have affected a £50 increase in average rents. How hard is it to increase management fees? Well, I've been quite conservative on that. I, I felt that um, the experience in Scotland might be, um, might be, too, might be too genial. Um, and that English landlords, under the cosh from uh, all of the, uh, the tax changes which have impacted their business model, and feeling that the government's kind of got it in for them, might be very, very resistant to agents increasing uh, management commission. I'm pleased to say that resistance has been more muted. And I think the reason for that is that this, this change has been well telegraphed. If landlords have multiple properties with multiple agents, they will have received multiple mailings from those agents saying, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to put your fees up. And therefore, our experience is that where we've written to landlords and increased our commission by between 1% and 2% extra, only about 5% of landlords have written back and said, you know, over this, you know, this is, this is, our, you know, this is, this is a bridge too far, you're not going to, you're not going to do it. So in fact, it has been easier to increase commissions than what we thought. The other thing that we've done is because, as David said, we, we run all of our, um, our systems and processes through the cloud, we've got very sophisticated MI, is that for every single one of our offices, we've run a segmentation report. So I can tell you, sir, that you've got 200 landlords, but what's interesting is that 20 of your landlords are still paying only 6%. And in many cases, our agents are saying, you know, you're right, that guy, you got a deal out of me. And I said it was a short-term deal, but he's had that deal for five years now. So we're actually helping them look at, at what they're charging individual landlords and moving the average up. So the 6% guys are in some cases going straight to 8%. The 9% guys were maybe sort of holding it at from sort of 9 to 10%. So it's quite a sophisticated approach. And we've got two full-time staff members uh, very experienced operators working for our, uh, our CFO on, on that mitigation plan. The government also cut us a little bit of slack. Um, government hasn't, got, hasn't normally done that, um, but it, um, it allowed us to continue charging existing tenants fees up until the 31st of May. So what we call in-tenancy fees, things like renewal fees, uh, substitution of sharers, Fees like that, we can still charge until the 31st of May of next year. And in total, that's about another million pounds of network revenue. So we, we told our investors that it might take us two years or more to fully mitigate the effects of the ban. We're now very confident we can fully mitigate by the end of 2020 trading. If we look at initiatives for growth, and then um, I'll move quickly on to Outlook, so we've got time for questions. Um, we've talked about our digital marketing. Um, upcoming stuff, we're, we're refreshing all of our brands and, and, and websites, um, just, just part of the service we provide to franchisees free of charge. We've got a, a new proposition for landlords that we're relaunching in, in Q3 um, because uh, we can guarantee that landlords will receive rent come what may on, say, the 20th of the month. And, and having tested this with landlords, that they say that's a key reason why they would instruct a managing agent. They just, they're, 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 they're kind of completely divorced then from whether the tenant pays or not, they will get their rent on the 20th of, uh, of, the, of the month. And we've mentioned our financial services. Um, we believe there's a lot of headroom to improve that if we can get the, the, the right uh, proposition. We believe that probably the right way to go is to add it as a, as a, as a franchise uh, opportunity. So our existing franchisees can run a financial services franchise alongside their lettings and, and sales business. And we believe that that ownership has been lacking from our current proposition. It's been feeding through to a third party 
And if we make that a franchise opportunity that our franchisees can put their arms around and, and, and hug to their chest, they'll love it and they'll want to grow it. And therefore, you'll see us um, uh, see us swiveling in that way. And the good news is that like all franchise um, opportunities, um, it will be uh, l- low capital consumptive as far as we're concerned. This won't hurt the balance sheet to do this, um, but it will drive more revenue over the next uh, next several years. So turning to Outlook then, and then I'll, I'll close out for the Q&A. Um, despite the sort of uh, this shift away from transactional fees, we still believe that um, the second half of the year um, will be stronger than uh, the first half of the year. Uh, the lettings book is growing. There is some pent up demand from tenants. And we believe that H2 trading will, will be stronger like it always has been. Um, we see that there is a lot of political noise around buy to let at the moment. Um, but a little known fact is that only 15.15% of all landlords currently use a managing agent. Half landlords don't even use an agent to find tenants. They continue just to use their own network or you know, classified advertising. Um, so only half, of age, only half of landlords use an agent at all, but of the whole landlord population, uh, a YouGov survey um, proved that only 15% are using a managing agent. That means that uh, it's conceivable that the buy-to-let sector could shrink. I'm not saying it will, but it could shrink, and yet we could thrive because all it takes is for those landlords who remain in the sector to decide that it's better to use an agent for us to to, to grow our market share. And one of the reasons why landlords may want to use an agent is that the government and the courts are making it increasingly risky to to do it with a DIY amateur approach. If you get the gas safety certificate wrong now, the courts will refuse to grant you a possession order if you try and remove your tenant. So do it yourself and and, and make a whoopsie and you could be be left effectively with a tenant in your property long term that you can't evict. So if you're in buy to let, and I still believe it's a great asset class, then there are more compelling reasons why you ought to use professional managing agents. The government's also going to insist that the agents who are trading are professional because it's going to make us all pass our exams and you'll have to be licensed to be a, to be a, a managing agent and look after other people's property and other people's, uh, other people's uh, rents. Uh, that's a good thing. And of course, that's what we used to do. We used to teach tennis coaches and vicars how to become letting agents. We'll just have to make sure that all of our existing um, uh, franchisees can pass the exams and, 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 and make sure that we, we keep them trading. So we believe that um, our model is a strong model. We, we see people like LSL kind of reversing into franchising, and we're a bit cynical because it's not because they love franchising. It's, it's because they have to do it as a response to conditions. But we do love franchising. We're passionate about franchising, and we believe it's a really strong model for, for the estate agency sector. It means that we've got central infrastructure We've got brands that we're powering, and yet we've also got these owner managers who um, you know, come into the shop every day and pay close attention to the detail in the way that salaried employees just never do. Uh, and I think the evidence is that you know, despite all of the headwinds that we faced uh, this year, um, we have um, put out another good set of numbers. And uh, David, David mentioned it in, 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 in passing, we've actually got the lowest number of franchisees that we've ever had seeking to exit. Um, only five of our traditional brand franchises are up for sale at the moment, and none of them are, 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 are big, high-profit businesses. Um, if any of those businesses came to the market, whoosh, they'd be straight out the door, I'd have a buyer for them. So the model is working. The franchise model is working, and and despite everything, you know we're we're not going to um, be stopped living in houses anytime soon. Um, so whether we, we're buying them or whether we're renting them, you know we we are in a market sector where there's um, there's uh, there's plenty of uh, plenty of future demand. If there's any any questions, happy to take them. Uh, I was interested to hear you talk about <clears throat> your uh, plans for. Uh, expansion of financial services and you said you expect to do that at low cap- capital cost that tells me that you've already got the resources in house and that you're not going to require to acquire something to, to do it. Could you comment on that 
and also just what tell me what specifically you mean by financial services, what you're covering within that. Uh, have we got the resources? We have, um, through introductions from our board actually, uh, we have identified um, some individuals who are going to work with us on this. Um, we had a, as, as much as I can probably say at this point in time, because they've got a few things that they need to do. Uh, when we say financial services, we mean the whole range. We mean mortgages, life, general insurance. Um, there's a wills division, buy to let's very specialised these days and getting more specialised, so we'll, we'll have that area to take care of. Um, uh, products to protect tenants uh, in the future. Absolutely, absolutely everything um, that we think a modern financial service offering should have, we'll have access to. What, what we are cognizant of is that there are some further changes um, coming in from uh, FCA uh, later this year. And uh, what they're doing is they're, they're widening the scope of, of who gets, who gets collared uh, if, if there are problems. Um, and, and that's going to make life quite challenging for some uh, directly regulated businesses. So I think what you'll see is that uh, the networks and, and their hold over, over um, uh, financial services will become stronger more businesses are going to have to shelter within a network. And I think that um, we will end up not wanting ourselves to probably be direct, directly regulated. We'll have a network partnership um, and we'll, we'll recognise that there's a, an infrastructure benefit in that. Um, but I think the crucial thing for us is that we, we've come to a view that unless the franchisees have a direct stake in it, unless they can see it's their financial services business and they're getting, you know, they're getting plenty of the action uh, on, on terms of the returns, then I think there's always this sort of sense of, you know, well, yeah, it's happening over there, but it's, it's, not, it's not mine. And... Um, uh, and, 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 and therefore it comes back to, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your heart's in franchising, you always have to have your franchisees' interests right at the top of the list. And, and if, if they're not, they get a sense of that and they don't fully commit and therefore you don't get the full benefit. And, uh, and I think that's where we've probably gone, gone wrong. We've said over here, there's financial service. You can feed stuff through, but actually... It's, it doesn't feel like their business, and that's what we've got to address. That's very. That's an extremely important comment. Uh, on the rent on time, uh, who bears the default risk on rents not being paid? But effectively, it's an insure. It's an insurance behind the scenes on that. So it's it's not the franchisee. It's not ourselves. Um, it's a third party. There's um it it I, I mean I'm I'm sure probably at least some of you are buy to let investors the story and I'll, I'll be quick um the story about um, referencing tenants is quite extraordinary in the old days we used to do employment references and bank references I, I remember that I'm old enough um, and we had a five percent default rate of, um, as soon as we introduced credit checking we got that default rate down to one percent. It's now something like 0.2 percent if you use you know really high quality referencing agents. As a result, you can buy insurance against your tenant defaulting for an annual premium of about 130 pounds. It's an absolute stone cold bargain because that will cover you for six months rental losses and um, fully cover you against the cost of having to go to court and, 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 and evict the tenants. Court costs and legal costs now about 1,200 pounds a case. So the improvement in credit referencing techniques and the ability to weed out the tenants who are likely to default has resulted in tremendous um, uh, uh, deals on, on insurance. As a result, it becomes economic for us to say, if you'll instruct us and agree to pay us our 10% commission, we'll give you a guarantee that your rent will be paid on the 15th, 20th of the month. Absolute guarantee it. Well, how can you do that? Well, because I'll give you a contractual guarantee. And then behind the scenes, what we're doing is we're, we're passing off that risk to, to an underwriter because we can buy that insurance cover at such attractive prices. Sorry, do you buy it or does the um, franchisee buy it? The franchisee buys it. And uh, it's an in, it's, it, legally it's called an interest in. So the landlord's interest in the policy is recognised by the underwriter but ultimately the policy is held by the franchisee and they would instigate any claims and they would be in a position therefore to, to manage the whole process without the landlord having to, to, to get involved. Do, do you charge any commissions for facilitating that? Um, 
we are charging in some markets we're charging a two percent premium over our standard uh, management commission so we'd say look it's ten percent but if obviously if the tenant defaults you know we'll do our best but um or we'll charge twelve percent and we'll guarantee rent on time and at a two percent markup even in uh northern towns um there is actually well, average rents are about sort of five fifty six hundred pounds there is in fact um, a small margin for the franchisee in that. So it's, it, it, I mean, it, it, you know, if, if you are buy to let landlords and you haven't got rent uh, guarantee insurance, I mean, I really would counsel you to buy it because it's, it's a, it's a, it is a stone cold bargain. How are you going to handle all these various models that you're going to have to, if, you, if you're going to have insurance, and you're going to have, um, well, I couldn't write it down fast enough, <laughs> but um, yeah. all the various things, yes. I mean, let, let's just stick to mortgages for the moment. How are you going to deal with that? Is that going to be your own business? Are you going to it's, find it, people? You know, it, or it's you one of those questions it? that's run around in, in my head, I don't know about Ian's, for about the last two years, about yeah. where do you find somebody who can do that, And but we have found somebody. Um, and they, they run that type of operation already. Um, so um, the access to the services is, is, fairly straight, is fairly straightforward. Yeah, but do you hire people? Or, do you, or are, the, are these self-employed contractors? They, they will be a, a, a mix, quite frankly, because in our network, some people or some franchisees will not have sufficient business to be able to have an advisor in their office. Mm. So for those, we will um, provide um, what, what's happening typically in the industry, which is a call centre uh, operation for them. We'll then have those who either themselves or, or in a, a small group, because they're in a very close-knit uh, region, um, can have uh, an advisor that comes into the office either permanently there or, or, or comes at certain times every day. Now, um, the, there are various models that can run around that as well. So they can be employed by the franchisee. Um, certainly, if they take a franchise, they would be employed by the franchisee. If, they, uh, if the franchisee doesn't want to take a franchise, but they still want the benefit of an advisor, a self-employed advisor can be put into the office. So we think think, you know, in terms of mortgages, that sort of covers off um, all the, the avenues um, that there are. Of course, we, we do generate a lot of uh, interest off our own websites, um, more and more, um, <coughs> and that we will feed into a, a call centre operation again um, to facilitate uh, the progress of that, that business. But, but I think we've, we've got most of the channels there covered now. It's, um, there's also the case that, you know, franchisees may currently um, refer to an independent um, financial services advisor mm -hmm. down the road, um, and they've just got a, a good, good relationship with that person over the years. What we're going to say is um, we're happy to approach that person and offer them to come within a network, because if they're currently directly regulated or with a, they're with a smaller network, we can probably give them advantages coming into a bigger network and, and, and you know, certainly in terms of um, purchasing power, group deals, uh, exclusives. So um, we would like to think that um, if you give us sort of three years, that we have quite a high percentage of our franchisees actually either um, operating their own um, financial services business through, um, through a franchise model and, and through a regulatory network um, or have access to those services from a neighbour. We accept that not everyone's going to want to do it, but, but, we, but we believe some will. And I've also um, I've been doing a sort of deep dive into financial <coughs> services, David and I, over the last, last, um, last sort of nine months. Um, it's also quite surprising that um, if you've got 10 sales through an office, you can probably uh, support an advisor. And the reason for that is that, you know, ignorant people like me think, well, 10 sales, how, how could you kind of, you know, you couldn't possibly sort of, you know, justify an advisor. But actually, all you need is a certain level of transactions going through because what, what, what you have then are all the people that say, well, I'm interested in buying in this area. You don't need them to buy your properties in order to organize their mortgage. So effectively, properties for sale are like lead bait, for want of a better description, that results in you registering buyers, and it's the registered buyers that form the uh, raw material to support a financial services business. So it's, 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 it, 
I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lettings guy. That's my background. Then I, I learned a bit about franchising. So I'm having to educate myself in financial services. But I do believe that we could add a financial services business, a significant one to what we're currently doing. I mean, hey, we, you know, we're, we're, we're selling, buying and selling, you know, even in this market, we'll do 11,000 sales this year. If we can't do financial services on the back of 11,000 sales, we should be taken out and shot. So we, we just need to sort of get, get, get the better model in place. And I think that under our noses has always been the better model, which is how do you get the franchisee involved? How do you make them stakeholders? How can they earn out of it? Um, and and, and that, that, that's, that's cool. Um, the other thing, sorry, I, I, I was talking to one of my top guys um, and he said, look, you, keep, you guys keep banging on about conveyancing. You can make a lot of money out of conveyancing. You can buy a conveyance for about £250 through one of the big um, uh, conveyancing sheds up in the Midlands. And you can sell that here in the London market for £1,000. So you're making a margin. Even in the provincial market, you can charge out at 500 quid. Um, so you can make really good margin. And he said, but I just don't want to do that. But, but why not? Why not? He said, because I've got a local firm of solicitors and they give me probate work. And he said, whenever you get a bit of probate work, you'll always have another family member who decides that because Santi Vera's now passed away, and there's a house for sale and there's some proceeds to be split up. It's time that we you know, sold our property and, you know, did something else. So he said, off every probate, I'll always get another bit of business. And he said, I've got one of my offices where one probate sale per month, which means two extra sales per month, is a difference between me breaking even and making a profit. So he said, thank you for your offer to use the conveyancing shed up in the Midlands, but I won't be taking you up with it. And so, you know, as always, sometimes you have to just dive a little bit deeper and understand the dynamics about a business before you can make the right choices. So we're not going to get too excited about conveyancing. We'll park that up for another day. What we need to do is a financial services offering that franchisees believe in, and, and, and you'll, see us, um, you'll see us bring that to the table within the next year. How strongly do you feel about the increased uh, changes in the regulation and the compliance uh, sort of the aspect of the letting agency businesses? Well, I, um, I, I, I don't like what I don't know in the sense that um, g government, of course, isn't doing this because it loves agents and it wants to sort of see a, a more professional environment, which is, you know, a, a nicer place to do business. Um, it, it, it does it to, to, to win elections and score points with the electorate, and, and, and I, I get that. So given that, you kind of worry about whether there are unintended consequences of regulation that we can't quite spot and, and life will be, become harder. I'll give you a very good example. The banks, of course, got all a bit obsessed about money laundering. Now, of course, everyone must believe that, you know, anti-money laundering legislation would be a good thing. How, how can it not be, you know? Um, you know, we, we, we don't want a black market in money and, you know, mafia cash and all that kind of good stuff. I'll give you an example. There are banks who have decided that they will force agents to have either one client account per landlord or you've got to close all your accounts down. So we've had to be moving our offices from this bank to other banks. Now, that, that's just a pain and it's just a cost of doing business. So I worry about unintended consequences. But... In principle, I would wholly welcome professionalization of the sector. Um, it'll, it'll have two benefits. One, it'll drive out people that I don't want to be associated with because they rip clients off, they steal money, they, they, they cause us a bad reputation. But secondly, I don't know many people who um, graduate with a good degree and when asked what they're going to do, say, I'm going to become a letting agent. You know, it, it, it's still a sort of an industry where you fall into at 16 and, and you end up, you know, running a, a decent business in your 30s and your 40s. It's not an aspirational uh, destination. It's not like, you know, David wanted to become an accountant. You know, my mum wanted me to become a lawyer. Um, God, God love her. Um, so, you know, no one wants to become the state agent, the letting agent. And therefore, I think professionalization will, will ultimately get better caliber people. But we, you know, it's not me, it's the next generation. So from that point of view, I think that's a, that's a good thing too. Thank you for t giving up your time today and coming and showing an interest in us. Thank you.